Inhibition appears to be state dependent. It's determined by context and other situational factors. In other words, it is not an inborn stable trait. The same person who can't inhibit in one realm will be able to do it in another realm. If they can't do it on a Monday, they might be able to do it on a Tuesday. It's not stable. So much so these researchers argued, we've got to stop treating inhibition like a trait and we got to stop using it as a diagnostic tool. It doesn't make sense. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is called On the Unreliability of the Stop Signal Task, Measures of Inhibition Lack Stability Over Time by Thunberg and colleagues. How dare you! Now I selected this paper because it's raised a lot of questions in my mind that I'm still kind of battling with so I thought I'd just share those all with you. So to understand what's going on we have to talk inhibition. Now as you know inhibition is the ability to stop an unwanted action or unwanted behavior and it's typically a sign of higher order cognitive development. We think of inhibition as a higher order skill. Now the best way we have to test inhibition is what's called the stop signal task. So this was a task developed about 60 years ago and it's the gold standard. It's what we use all the time and here's how it works. So it's based on reaction time. Every once in a while you'll get a little go signal and you have to push a button as quickly as you can. So we're measuring reaction speed. But every once in a while after the go signal a little stop signal will pop up. And when you see that you don't want to press the button. You want to hold back or inhibit your response. Now the distance between the go and the stop signal is a measure of your inhibitory ability. So some people need the two very close. Anything more than like 100 milliseconds they can't stop themselves. But some people can stretch that out to 200, 300, 400 milliseconds and still stop just fine. Now research has shown that inhibition is very stable within one testing session. So if you do this task for like 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours, your inhibition measure basically stays the same. So for that reason we've always thought inhibition was a trait. It's an inborn thing that we can measure and then use to differentiate between people, diagnose different disorders like ADD or ASD. And that's where this paper comes in. This paper says, yeah, it's highly stable within a testing session, but what if we test the same person multiple times over weeks? Does it stay the same between sessions? So these researchers recruited 98 people and they gave them this stop signal task multiple times with at least one week break in between to see is inhibition stable over time. And what did they find? To understand they ran correlations. Now what we're looking at is here. Any correlation above 0.75 is considered stable. So that's kind of our marker to determine whether or not something is an absolute trait. So what did they find? Within each individual session inhibition appeared very stable at about 0.86. And these researchers also looked at some physiological markers of inhibitions, things that we expect to go on in the brain or the muscles while you're inhibiting a response. And they found within session brain response was stable at 0.73 and muscular response was stable at 0.74. So these appear to be pretty stable traits. But what happens when we look between testing sessions? Now all of a sudden inhibition drops to 0.54 muscle measures drop to 0.4 and brain measures drop to 0.17. So reliability is basically gone. Inhibition appears to be state dependent. It's determined by context and other situational factors. In other words, it is not an inborn stable trait. The same person who can't inhibit in one realm will be able to do it in another realm. If they can't do it on a Monday, they might be able to do it on a Tuesday. It's not stable. So much so these researchers argued, we've got to stop treating inhibition like a trait and we got to stop using it as a diagnostic tool. It doesn't make sense. So now let's bring this back to us. What does this mean for us? And here's where I've got a bunch of questions, but no real answers. So hopefully this will just get us thinking. The first question is of course diagnostic. What does this mean about things like ADD and ADHD? I have no problem considering them disorders of thought or disorders of learning, but how stable are they? Are they context dependent disorders. Now we can start to ask are some learning disorders different from medical disorders? Like if you have cancer you will have cancer 24 hours a day 7 days a week. But with psychological disorders maybe they are situationally dependent. In which case we can start to ask what contexts bring it about and can we start to remediate or play with those contexts? Which leads to another question what are some other things we believe are stable inborn traits that simply aren't. We treat them as such but they're state dependent. Personality, well-being, sense of belonging might change day by day context by context. Which brings us to another question, how then do we measure the things we care about? A lot of schools are now trying to give learner profiles. How creative are you? How collaborative are you? How outgoing are you? When we measure these things and we give kids a single score we're treating those like traits. But they most certainly aren't. There's every chance that a kid who's creative in one class 
wouldn't be creative in another. Or a kid who has a sense of belonging in math class doesn't have it in science class. So by treating things like traits and giving a single measure, we're probably hiding the nuance, the context dependent nature of that thing. Which means if we wanna give learner profiles, we'll probably have to do it in every context, in every year. It's not one profile, it's a dozen profiles, one for each class, probably multiple times in a year to see what are the contextual factors impacting all of these different measures. Again, like I said, this paper hasn't supplied a bunch of answers, but my goodness, it's giving me a lot of questions that I've really been milling about, and I hope it kind of raises the same questions for you. For 60 years, we have assumed we can measure this inborn thing, and now we're starting to see there is no inborn thing. We've been measuring an ephemera, and where else are we unknowingly doing that, especially in school? So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you got something good for that and some good ideas to kind of toss around. If you like what you saw, if you can give us a thumbs up and subscribe below. It'll make sure more people get a chance to see this video on YouTube. Otherwise, thank you all so much, and I'll see you at the next one. Bye, y'all.